Good morning and happy Valentine's Day. We're so glad you are joining us here at New Bethel Baptist Church. We do want you to join in. Sing along with our praise team, grab your Bible, and be ready to study God's Word in just a moment. Let's worship together. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Great things he has taught us. Great things he has done. And he 
tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever I stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is gone. Once again, good morning. I wonder how many of you liked taking tests in school? No? Was it the, just the idea of testing? Was it that you had a hard time sitting still for a long period of time? Was it trying to remember all of whatever you had been taught? Or was it you, you just didn't like the questions themselves? There are a lot of kinds of questions. I liked some more than others. For example, multiple choice questions. You know the kind. What color is a cloudless sky at noon? A, green. B, blue. C, red. D, none of the above. You should know the answer to that one. I had a professor who called those multiple guess questions. There are true and false questions, you know, true or false. An elephant begins life as a tadpole. There are questions which require math to answer. There are questions re which require written answers. Some just a single word, some sentences, and some essays. In most teaching situations, the person asking the question well, they already know the answer. For example, the teacher asks a child, what is two plus two? Not because the teacher does not know, but because they want to see if the child responds correctly. So in your life, why do you ask questions? Now, if you're a teacher, I'm not talking about a, a teaching environment. In your life, with your family, with your friends, in your own head, why do you ask questions? And, and here's something relevant to today. When you talk to God, do you ask questions? I see that quite a bit. It seems like the most common question that we ask God is actually the same one my children asked when they were small. Why? Why is the dog furry? Why is water wet? Why is the sky blue? Why, why, why? We ask God why. Why did this happen? Why am I going through that? Why is there evil? Why don't you do something about him or her? Why, God? Why? Did you know God asks questions of people. He does a lot of questions. According to some counts, Jesus asked 
135 questions in the Gospels. To Job, God asked 75 or more than 75 questions, and most of them were in chapters 38 and 39. There are hundreds of questions from God addressed to people in the Bible. Why does God ask questions? Well, that answer depends on the person and the situation. For the next 10 weeks, we're going to focus on different questions God asks. Before we start on the series, I want to make sure you're clear on something. God does not ask questions because he lacks knowledge. God is omniscient. That is, he knows everything. Psalm 147 verse 5 says, Great is our Lord, and abundant in power, his understanding is beyond measure. His understanding is beyond measure is a way of saying that God knows everything about all things. He knows everything that's happened in the past. He knows everything that is happening at this moment. And, he's, and he knows everything that will happen. God's knowledge is so knowledgeable that he knows every variation of every possible decision that you may or may not make. <laughs> it's pretty impressive, really. If he did not know everything, he would not be God. But he is. God asks questions because he wants us to think about something. He might ask a question because he wants us to reconsider a decision that we have made or refuse to make. He may ask questions to see if we've learned a particular lesson so that he can move us along in our maturity as believers. There are many, many reasons that God asks questions and many questions God asks. Let's take a look at the first question God asked in the Bible. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis to Genesis 3, verses 1 through 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was de to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, 
the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this word today. We pray today, Father, that you would help us to understand why you would ask, where are you? And to understand what that means to us. That we would leave this study today understanding where we are in relationship to you and to Jesus. And it's how we could be in that relationship with you through Jesus. Help us to understand where we are with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have ever played hide and seek? What we just read in Genesis is kind of a case of hide and seek, but this story is not a game. Rather than saying, ready or not, here I come, God simply speaks a question. Where are you? The events of Genesis 3 are the tragic beginning of sin. Now, what we see here is not called sin, not out loud anyway, but it is a graphic picture of it. God created the world and the universe and said, it is good. Then he added man and said, it is very good. God created the world for us, not for himself. God doesn't need the world. He's above and beyond any material thing. God is spirit, and as such, material things are not needed. We, however, are material as well as spiritual. And our material selves, well, we do need a world. So God made one suited perfectly for us. God is love. Well, we learned that when we saw the crazy guy with the rainbow wig at sporting events with a sign that read John 3.16. Or we might have learned it in Sunday school. God is love. And love looks for a place to express itself and for someone to return love. So God created people. And too often we think of mankind and our, our great ability to do evil. But because we're created in the image of God, we have an even greater capacity to love. God created someone to share his love and wanted that creation, us, to choose freely and wholly to love him in return. To do that, God created a single, simple choice. The garden was paradise. Everything about the world, and the garden particularly, was declared very good by God. But we saw here in this chapter, there's trouble in paradise. What was the problem? Adam and Eve are in the garden. God has given them everything they need to live and thrive. And we, we normally think of the Garden of Eden as being perfect. And I think it was, with one minor exception, a slithering, sneaking, speaking serpent. The serpent is described there in verse 1 as crafty. Now, in the Bible, crafty usually suggests wisdom and cleverness, but the snake's craftiness is used in the way we use it in our English understanding. He was discerning, but he was also devious and deceitful. We have no idea when the serpent became what he is. We have no idea why a serpent was chosen as the, the instrument of deception. For most of us, maybe I'm speaking for myself, we don't like snakes. And maybe this is the reason why. The serpent is just another one of the beasts of the field until it becomes a tool of Satan. And from then on, Satan himself is identified as the great serpent. That's his description. In Revelation, uh, in a couple of places, Revelation 20 verse 2 says, And the angel sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. This serpent speaks. 
<laughs> I'm kind of glad snakes today don't speak. I can't imagine the nightmares of children and adults if they could speak. The serpent asks the question, which on the surface appears to be an innocent question. It seems to be a question for clarification. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any of the trees in the garden? What seems innocent is leading to a trap. Satan knew this was a twisting of God's word and was intentionally misquoting what God did say. A simple observation of the man and the woman on any given day would have supplied the answer. That's what they ate. No, God did not say we could eat. God did say we could eat from any of the trees. Casually, Eve answers. We may eat of the fruit trees in the garden. Then she outlines what she's been told by Adam. Eve wasn't there when the rule was given out. She can only repeat what she's been told. Verse 3 says, But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. In Genesis 2, verse 17, God tells Adam, Do not eat of that tree, or death will follow. Eve adds to the prohibition, by including not touching the tree. Now, that may, that may have been a good add on Adam's part because he didn't want anything to happen to Eve. I mean, she just showed up and, wow, she's gorgeous. Or to future little Adams or little Eves. The serpent places the bait of the trap in front of Eve. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will not die. You will become wise. You will be like God. That's the temptation. That is the bait. And Eve bit. And so did Adam. One part of the bait was knowing good and evil. Now, I always thought Adam and Eve knew good. In fact, I thought that was the only thing they did know. Everything where they were, everything in the garden was good, apparently. Even the forbidden tree was good to look at. But without bad, can we know good? Without evil, can we really understand good? Adam and Eve were not knowledgeable about such things. They were innocent. What they knew was God. Most of the time, we attribute the original sin to Eve. It appears she took a bite before Adam. I have a little bit of a twist, a little bit of another opinion about that. To me, it appears the original sin is Adam's, or maybe the cause of it. Uh, first, because Adam was the responsible party. Uh, the New Testament details two Adams. The, the first Adam, here in the garden, is said to be the father of sin. The second Adam, and that's a description of Christ Jesus, is the father of salvation. Adam was given the responsibility for the care of the garden. Eve was not. Before Eve was ever in the picture, in Genesis 2.15, it says the Lord God took the man that he had created and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Now, keep means to be in charge of, to protect, and to preserve. Adam's responsibility was for both Eve and for the snake. If Adam, who was right there with his wife, if Adam had done his job, he would have, he would have grabbed Eve by the arm and pulled her away, the ser serpent by the snake, and put a stop to this whole thing right there on the spot. Adam's failure to do that was, is, in my mind, the first sin or the cause, the root of the first sin. Because of Adam's failure, 
the fruit of the forbidden tree was eaten. And that is the problem. Sin was created in the moment Adam and Eve chomped down on that forbidden fruit. Satan deceived and tempted. Adam and Eve took the bait and sinned. God did not create sin. God did not inspire sin. God did not cause sin. God gave the simplest choice. Go anywhere, eat from any tree except one. They had a whole world full of variety and delicious choices. Only one in the world was forbidden. And they disregarded the command of God. They violated the agreement with God. They chose themselves rather than God. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 12, says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Satan, the, the serpent's voice in Genesis 3, is all about sin. Jesus talks about Satan in John chapter 8, verse 44. He says, you are your father, the devil. You are of your father, the devil. And you will to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of of lies. The problem in Genesis 3 is summed up in a word. Sin. What was the immediate result? Verse 6 says they ate. Then verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed, together fig, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Immediately. As soon as they tasted the fruit, as soon as they swallowed that first bite, everything changed. Now, often in Scripture, we see things happen immediately. On Wednesday nights, we are studying in the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 3, there's a man who's been lame for over 40 years. And in Jesus' name, he is healed and immediately... He stands up and begins walking and leaping. There's no gradual, it's, it's immediate. In the first couple's case, they see things differently. Their eyes are opened to their own nakedness. They blush. They're embarrassed. They have been nude and now they feel naked. That's what we'd say in the South, naked. I, I think... This eye opening extended to other things. Where before that bluff off in the distance was a beautiful place to watch a sunrise, now there's a fear of heights. Where before the river looked smooth and calm, now they see that it's deep and dangerous. And with the opening of the eyes comes shame and guilt. They knew immediately that they had done wrong. And they tried to cover their shame by sewing fig leaves together to wear his clothes. They tried to hide their guilt by hiding from God. They knew it immediately. And God knew it too. Apparently God came regularly to the garden. God appears in the garden in the usual place at the usual time only this time, for the first time, Adam and Eve do not come running to meet him. God moves in the garden, and Adam and Eve think they can win this new game 
called Hide and Seek. The next question we see here is, what was the purpose for God's question? God calls out to Adam, where are you? Did God not know where they were? Well, certainly he did. He had put them each in the garden. He knew which tree they were hiding behind. So why the question? The question was not simply because they were out of place. God knew exactly where Adam and Eve were physically located. The, the question was for their benefit. Now, I believe because God is loving and gracious and merciful, he was offering them a, a, a chance to confess. God was in essence saying, you disobeyed me. How's that working out for you? Did things turn out like you wanted? Or did things turn out how I predicted? The question from God was not physical location, but it was about Adam's position. Adam was given the blessing of the world and the garden and Eve. He was given the blessing of being the guardian and the guide. Adam's position was not fulfilled. He was out of position where his role in the garden on earth was concerned. And as far as the relationship with God was concerned, he was also out of position. Adam's place was near God. Adam and Eve were created to be in a relationship with God. And now they're hiding. They were avoiding the very thing for which they had been created. They were made for God, not made to avoid God. Where are you? The question shows the heart of God, which is, we see in the New Testament, the heart of a shepherd seeking out the lost lambs in order to bring them into the fold. Luke 19.10 says, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. What was their answer? As, as soon as God asks the question, Adam blurts out, I was afraid. Adam had never felt fear before. He had never been afraid of God. He'd always felt comfort and security. Now he felt fear. I was naked. Now, we have, the, we have the same embarrassment. Well, I'd say most people have that same embarrassment. We would not like for anybody, anybody else to see us without clothes. But this has never before been a problem because they had been so innocent that it never occurred to them. There was no wrong before the bite of sin. God asks another question. Who told you you were naked? And then he asks, did you eat of the tree? Again, God knew the answers before he asked the questions. Was this another opportunity for Adam to come clean? He doesn't. Rather, he says, she did it. First, he blames Eve. Then things, then it gets even worse. He says, the woman you gave me did it. Adam is in full on, all the way, sin mode. And he actually blames God. Eve is no better. God asks, what happened? And she turns to the serpent. The serpent did it. God called to Adam, where are you? I wonder, what would have happened if when God called, Adam stepped out from behind the tree and said, Lord, I failed. I did not guard the tree. I did not guard my wife. I ate the forbidden fruit. Can I ever be forgiven? What would have happened if Adam, rather than assigning blame, had confessed? 
How will you answer when God asks, where are you? I think today God asks each of us, where are you? Are you are you hiding from God? Are you embarrassed or ashamed or fearful because of your sin? God asks, where are you in relationship to God the Father? And he would say, where are you in relationship to my son, Jesus, whom I sent to you? God sent Jesus so that we would get a second chance, a chance to come clean, a chance to confess and be restored. God asks, where are you in the work I've gifted you to do? Are you in position? Are you doing your part? Where are you? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this encouraging word today. We see the challenge, the creation, the beginning of sin, but we also see, Father, that you went to Adam. You come to us in the form of Jesus. Uh, you come to us in our sin. You didn't come in anger to Adam. There were no lightning bolts in your hand. There was no anger in your voice. Father, you, you sent Jesus so that we might be restored to the relationship that was broken here in the garden. If someone's listening today and they haven't experienced that restoration, that returning to you, the forgiveness of their sins, I pray that today they would do what Adam did not do. They would admit that they are sinners, that they would believe in who Jesus is just as the scripture outlines it, and they would confess that. They would say to you that they admit they're a sinner and they repent from it, that they believe in Jesus and turn everything in their lives over to him. And in confessing those things to you and to others, your word promises that we will be saved. We will be restored to that right relationship with you. Father, we pray that you would help us to be in our places, to be in position. When you call, where are you? You would find us doing exactly what you would have us to be doing. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Get in place. Be in position because God's seeking people who are in the right places. God bless. Have a great week.